so these are my uh, disclosures and uh, this is what i'm going to tell you about today so i'm sure you're all very well aware of, of the fact that cancer cells from uh, any type of tumor pretty much some of these cells are able to leave the primary site or even if this is a metastasis they can live uh, they can they can enter the the bloodstream survive in the bloodstream and that's where we call them uh, circulating tumor cells or ctcs and then they can uh, land at a distant site and, and, and form a metastasis. This is how cancer kills. Uh, and that is because most of the cancers don't kill with the primary tumor, but, but they need to metastasize to become uh, deadly and, and become really incurable. And so uh, my lab tends to, to be very, very interested in this particular moment when the cells uh, leave the tumor and, and enter the bloodstream and survive. And uh, what is not always said, though, is that the vast majority of CTCs is, is, is really destined to, to die in circulation. Only very few will survive, and, and, and even fewer will, will be able to see the metastasis. And the identification of the biological features that characterizes the CTCs that succeed in forming a metastasis is, is, is very important, because this may lead us to new therapies in the future. So today, in, in approximately 20 minutes or, or, or a little bit more, I will tell you uh, how we capture CTCs from the blood of patients or, or, or mouse models, uh, why we specifically uh, some time ago decided to focus on, on CTC clusters in particular. And uh, uh, then I will uh, show you some of our recent data on biology and vulnerabilities of these clusters in a way that we can uh, not only capture them, but also learn their biology and attack them with new, uh, uh, new therapies. And at the end, I will briefly touch on, on, on some data that is uh, uh, coming out soon. So CTC capture is quite a, a, an interesting topic because, uh, because of the dilution factor of CTCs. You, you're probably aware that if you take a blood sample from a patient with, uh, with pretty much any cancer type, even if you look at very extreme cases with progressive disease, uh, not responding to any therapy, stage four, metastatic, um, in, in, in approximately 10, 10 milliliters of peripheral blood, uh, what we expect to find is somewhere around 50 billion red blood cells, 50 million white blood cells, and from zero to 10, roughly, circulating tumor cells. Most of the times we find zero, which is, uh, which is good for patients. Um, usually we find, uh, when, when we do find CTCs, we find very few. So this is exactly, uh, many people refer to CTCs when, when the, the, their dilution is one cell, uh, one CTC per ml of blood. But in fact, is is often less than that. And to, and to capture them is, is, is quite difficult. There are many technologies out there that are available at the moment. Uh, I, I would say with, with very different efficiencies in terms of capturing and in terms of preserving the, the, the original characteristics of the CTCs, you, you don't want to form uh, artificial uh, uh, things when you, when you look at CTCs, and that, that, that's quite a challenge. So in my lab, we use uh, um, uh, several of these technologies. In particular, we use technologies that are based on, uh, uh, that take advantage of the size of CTCs that is uh, usually a little bit uh, larger than uh, that of red and white blood cells. And uh, this technology in particular functions like this. So we take a blood sample. This is completely unprocessed. So we don't, we don't really add anything into the blood. And we, we run it directly into a microfluidic chip. The blood has to, uh, goes from the inlet and has to go uh, out to the outlet. And to do that has to pass through uh, some sort of a serpentine. And you can see a cross section of the serpentine, there's a narrowing uh, channel that leaves an opening of exactly six and a half micrometers. The six and a half micrometers is, is, is almost like a, like a magic number. So it, it really allows the passage of red and white blood cells because they have a diameter that is typically smaller than that. And they're also extremely uh, deformable because that's their nature. They need to navigate through capillaries and they need to be very deformable. So they can pass through very quickly and without any problem. Cancer cells, they have a, a very different nature. They have, first of all, they are bigger than six and a half micrometer in diameter, and, and they are much less deformable than blood cells. And so when you uh, pass the blood through here, we literally filter them out of blood. 
And to give you a sense of how this works, I'm showing you a video now, and I hope you can visualize it well via Zoom. Uh, we are imaging now from the from the top of the microfluidic cassette. This is in real time. Uh, and uh, you can see millions and millions of blood cells as they flow through the device. And you can uh, appreciate that uh, there is a darker part here. I'm pointing at it now. There is a darker region of the chip. This is the six and a half micrometer gap. Most cells are able to pass through and end up in this region that leads them to the waste. But there are also some cells here where I'm pointing that got stuck and they are not able to pass through. And when we switch the, 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 the colors of, in the microscope, we can confirm that these are cancer cells because they express uh, cancer associated markers. So with these technologies, we were finally able to, uh, to, to interrogate blood samples from patients with different cancer types and also from mouse models and ask uh, fundamental questions about how cancer spreads. Uh, when we started doing this, and, and the, the first work uh, uh, was done in the lab of Dan Haber in, in Boston, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is one of the first uh, clusters of circulating tumor cells that we found there. Uh, we, we, we saw these clusters, uh, but, but that's, that we really didn't know what to do with them because that's, that, that was not what the literature was telling us. Uh, literature was somehow telling us that metastasis happens through single uh, tumor cells that, that, that get away from the tumor and metastasize, even losing their cells at junctions. And then this is uh, instead a cluster of CTCs. And this was in particular from, uh, from a patient with prostate cancer. And there were also some white blood cells attached to it. And I will tell you about these white blood cells in a minute. But when we isolated these clusters, we, we really didn't know what they were doing. If they were contributing to metastasis, if they were completely irrelevant. And so we, we started looking into that. And I will go quickly through this data because it has been published a while ago. So this shows that the presence of these clusters in patients with breast cancer or prostate cancer is a very clear predictor of a poor outcome. In breast cancer, we could show that having cluster correlates to a shorter uh, progression free survival. In prostate cancer, we could monitor patients for much longer uh, period of time. And we could show that the, the, the presence of just one cluster during one single time point was enough to determine a very short overall survival compared to patients that had only single CTCs. So this somehow got us started. And we, we, we understood that having clusters in, in, in a patient is a, is, is, is a bad news for the patient. But are they really important for metastasis formation? And that's what this work that we did here has determined. So we, uh, we found a way to, to, to label clusters in mouse models, and we could determine uh, very clearly that, uh, that their presence uh, in, in, in the blood of these mice and, and their metastatic potential is much higher compared to single CTCs. And this is actually the, the quantification. So they are 50 times more likely to form metastasis compared to an equal number of single CTCs. And this is just uh, at that time was a, was a control experiment that demonstrated that clusters do not form from the aggregation of multiple CTCs, but they do uh, directly get out of the tumor as clusters. Uh, and also that uh, uh, the, 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 these clusters are, are oftentimes oligoclonal. So they carry multiple multiple distinct clones uh, from the tumor just in one cluster. So they may contribute to uh, oligoclonality of metastasis in, in one single event. Uh, then we, we, we had uh, literally a new research field ahead of us. Uh, we, we knew at that point that clusters were dangerous, and, but, but we didn't know much about their biology and, and even less about their, their vulnerabilities. And this was the, the, the work that has been initiated by, by Sofia Guntela, a postdoc in my lab, who now is her, her group at, at Novartis. What Sofia has done was, was something very ambitious. So she set up a single cell resolution DNA methylation profiling of primary single CTCs and CTC clusters directly isolated from the blood of women with breast cancer. So we, we, we analyzed the data and we saw that something very fundamental was happening. So we saw that CTC clusters were characterized by a number of regions in their DNA where, where methylation levels were particularly low. Uh, and the very same regions in single CTCs, even if, even if you took the single CTCs from the very same patient, were, were hypermethylated, so very, very high methylation levels. 
We then ask what type of regions these, these are, and they are the binding sites for a number of transcription factors. We, we of course, did this in patients and also repeated it in, in, in mouse models. Uh, quite busy slide here, but a long story short is that if you do a gene ontology analysis for these, these, these regions, it turns out that these are binding sites for very well-known transcription factors, uh, such as OCT4, SOX2, NANOG, as well as, as well as others. So in other words, whenever CTCs are in the form of a cluster, they, um, they reprogram themselves. And the, the binding sites for, for, for OCT4, SOX2, and NANOG, and other transcription factors that are uh, related to embryonic stem cells, they are now open up and, and are ready for, uh, for action. And uh, for, for time constraints, I'm not showing you a, a lot of data downstream of this, but basically the genes that are downstream of OCT4, SOX2, and NANO, they also get increasingly expressed in clusters. And this is one of the ways that clusters are able to seed new metastases, almost behaving like embryonic stem cells. Uh, Sophia then did a, a, a drug screen because we thought that uh, the, the, the clustering itself could determine these physical properties and, and, and biological properties, enhancing metastasis. So why don't we look for, uh, for anti-cancer drugs, but in a completely different way from what people have done before. So we are not going to look for drugs that kill tumor cells. Uh, but in this particular screening, we, we looked for drugs that separated cancer cells from one another. The way this, uh, this ran was we, we isolated clusters from, from patients with, with breast cancer. We then cultured them to, to expand them in vitro. And then uh, we, we screened 2,400 uh, FDA approved compounds. So these were, were compounds that are given uh, till, till today to, to patients with, with many, many different indications, not only cancer. And uh, uh, on the x-axis is viability, y-axis is cluster size, uh, the, the red and the green dots are controls. And we screened all these drugs and, and most of the drugs don't do absolutely anything to, to clusters. Some drugs reduce cluster size and you can see the, them here, but they also reduce viability. So these are drugs that are killing tumor cells. Uh, but what we were really interested on was, was the yellow dots. Uh, here, these are 39 compounds that uh, as, a, as a side effect, let's say, they, they can dissociate clusters of tumor cells uh, into, uh, into almost uh, single cells uh, without killing or with a very, very limited killing capability. And uh, many of these 39 compounds were inhibiting the same target, where were different drugs that had the same uh, um, uh, target is, uh, and that was the sodium potassium ATPase. And so we then did in vivo experiments with sodium potassium ATPase inhibitors. We transplanted CTCs from patients into the mammary fat pad of mice. We waited for a few months until they would form a tumor and until they would start uh, spontaneously to shed circulating tumor cells in the form of single cells or clusters. And then we treated with daily IP injections of sodium potassium ATPase inhibitors for three weeks, and then we terminated the experiment. When looking at primary tumor size, there was absolutely no change. So the, this was consistent with our no killing uh, approach. Uh, but when you looked at CTCs, you could see that these tumors were producing more single CTCs and less clusters. And this little unbalanced production of clusters and single CTCs led to a massive reduction in metastasis. So you could see that less clusters, even though the total number of CTCs was the same, less clusters meant, uh, this is a log scale. So in, in linear scale, there would be on average at least 80 fold less metastasis in mice treated with, uh, with sodium potassium ATPase inhibitors. And these are, these are some picture, pictures. So now these inhibitors are uh, um, approved, in particular for uh, treatment of uh, um, uh, cardiac arrhythmias. And uh, uh, we are now running a clinical trials with, with a number of investigators on the clinical side to test whether giving sodium potassium ATPase inhibitors to women that have uh, CTC clusters uh, uh, could be beneficial in terms of disassembling, dissociating these clusters. Uh, I told you before that uh, the CTC clusters do come sometimes in association with, uh, with uh, uh, white blood cells. Uh, this is a, a project that was uh, run uh, from a PhD student in my lab, Barbara Sicerba, 
And what Barbara wanted to figure out was really what, what, what type of white blood cells these are and, and what are they doing there? Are they trying to, to kill the cluster? Are they trying to, to help the cluster to metastasize? So we really didn't know. And so what Barbara did first, she looked at patients. Uh, she looked at the blood of, of women with breast cancer in particular uh, at different stages. Uh, and uh, uh, she looked at five different mouse models. We tried to be as broad as possible. So we included uh, patient-derived xenografts. We included uh, xenografts with uh, classical cell lines like in the MB231 from, from John um, Masage. Uh, uh, syngenetic models, uh, genetic and engineered mouse models, so with and without immune system. So we tried to be as, as broad as we could. And we found this, uh, what we now call CTC white blood cell clusters, pretty much all the time. They're they just coming at uh, different uh, frequencies. So in patients, they represent 3% uh, of the CTCs that we can find. In mouse models, they go from being extremely rare, like 0.1%, Xenografts with, with LM2 cells to ex being extremely prominent, like uh, in syngenetic models. We still don't know uh, what leads to this, uh, this, this, this differences in, 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 in abundance, but we are, we are trying to figure it out. Uh, what we do know, though, is, is that if you look at patients, those that have CTC or blood cell clusters are doing a lot worse than those that don't have them. And uh, those that don't have them, I'm including also patients with single CTCs, patients with clusters, and patients with uh, more than seven CTCs per seven and a half ml of blood, which is the FDA approved threshold for, for a poorer prognosis. What Barbara did then, she, uh, she disassembled the CTC white blood cell clusters into single cells with a robotic micromanipulator, and then she did single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, trying to assess uh, and to discover which type of white blood cells are they that travel with, with clusters. And we compare the transcriptomic of the cells to, to reference white blood cell populations that we could isolate from the very same uh, patients. Uh, we did that and you can see the, the results here. So that the red columns are the CTC associated white blood cells. Uh, the other columns represent different white blood cell populations. They tend to be associated with myeloid cells. And uh, then we repeated the same experiment in, in mouse models. We wanted to gain more confidence. We wanted to see how broad the, uh, broadly reproducible uh, this is. And we got exactly the same results. So they, they, they cluster very closely with, with myeloid cells. And then Barbara did stainings with well-known markers and she could determine pretty clearly that nine out of 10 times when you see a white blood cell associated to a CTC, uh, this cell is a neutrophil and uh, approximately 10% of the times it is, it is some, other cell type, some other white blood cell type. Then we did the opposite exercise. So we could pick the cancer cells that were traveling together with the neutrophils uh, and compare their transcriptome to the CTCs that were not traveling together with the neutrophils. And when we did that, the results were extremely clear for once. Uh, so we saw that whenever CTCs travel together with the neutrophils, they overexpress a number of genes that describe an active cell cycle and DNA replication uh, process. So in other words, if you travel as a cancer cell with your friend neutrophil, the cancer cells proliferates faster, proliferates more than a CTC that is not traveling with the neutrophil. We also wanted to do these experiments to, to, to clearly quantify it in the, in the most direct possible way, what is the contribution to metastasis of the three different types of CTCs that we know. So we, we, we had tumor bearing mice that were injected with cancer cells in the mammary fat pad. We waited until these mice would spontaneously shed from the tumor uh, CTCs, and then we, we isolated uh, 100 uh, cancer cells in the form of CTC neutrophil clusters and injected them in, in tumor-free recipient mice, 100 cancer cells from clusters and injected, and 100 single CTCs and injected. And then we measured for each of them the, the, the time to development of metastasis and actually the, the, the survival of the, of the mice. And so we found that uh, CTC neutrophil clusters are the most metastasis competent CTC subpopulations, at least in, the, in, in breast cancer, in the models that we tested, followed by CTC clusters and then single CTCs, which are really not good at forming metastasis. They do form metastasis if you wait long enough, but then uh, Barbara wanted to finish her PhD, so we, 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 we had to stop at some point. Uh, so going one step back, 
uh, we realized recently that we don't really know what leads to the formation of these clusters in the first place. <clears throat> and uh, Cinzia Donato, a PhD student in the lab, she had some hints that uh, this could have something to do with hypoxia. And these hints were, were, were coming from recent RNA sequencing data that we, that, that we developed. And so what Cinzia did, she set up uh, what, what we call a hypoxia reporter vector. So she lentivirally transduced uh, cancer cells, uh, engineered them in this way uh, that whenever uh, if one alpha, which is the master um, uh, transcription factor that, that is uh, activated during hypoxia, Whenever if one alpha is active, it would bind uh, here to the promoter and lead to the transcription of YFP. So in other words, cells that are experiencing hypoxia for a prolonged enough tumor period of time would turn yellow. And so we validated this vector in vitro first. So you can see that when we put cells in hypoxic uh, conditions, they, they turn on YFP. And then when we put them back in normoxic conditions, they, they turn it off. And then Cinzia injected these cells in, in mice. And I'm going to start the video in a second. I'll just tell you what, what is coming so that you, you know. Uh, so she, she let the tumors form. Uh, tumors were engineers with, engineered with the system that I, uh, that I told you. And then she, uh, she took slices of the tumors from the bottom to the top. And, at the, uh, and you can see in red is normoxic tumor cells and in yellow is hypoxic tumor cells. And now we are literally walking the tumor from the bottom to, to, to the top. And the, the dogma is that hypoxia is only in the core of the tumor, but you can really see that uh, it's, it's, not, it's not always the case. So in this particular model, hypoxia is, is very much spread out throughout the tumor, not, not, not exactly only in the, in the core. And if you zoom in, you can see that there are hypoxic regions here, and I, I'm going to pause it for a second. There are hypoxic regions in the tumor here, and there are, there are blood vessels that feed directly into it. So hypoxia does not mean zero blood vessels. Hypoxia means less blood vessels. And so when there are blood vessels there, that means that hypoxic cells also have a chance to intravasate and to become circulating tumor cells. And then when we go uh, uh, elsewhere and we look for, for a different region, for a normoxic region, for example, you can also see in this case, there are blood vessels clearly visible uh, in this uh, picture and surrounded by normoxic tumor cells. So both hypoxic and normoxic have, uh, have a chance to intravasate uh, and, and to become circulating tumor cells. And the idea, at least in the models that we looked at, is that hypoxia does not really only happen in the core of the tumor, but is really, uh, much more widespread. What Cinzia did then, she, she took these tumors out and, and she disassembled them in, into single cells and she separated hypoxic versus normoxic cells and then she did uh, proteomics analysis. Um, the, 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 we couldn't really find something like this done before. Mo most of the analysis of hypoxic and normoxic cells we could find in the literature were done, were done in vitro. So we, we, when one could, would put cancer cells in a hypoxia incubator for as long as they, they wanted and, and then get them out and, and test uh, whatever they wanted to test. In vivo is different because uh, you, you, first of all, you don't get to set the oxygen levels in the mouse. Uh, the, these, are, these are physiological. And, and secondly, because cancer cells are then exposed for, for different times uh, to, to lower oxygen levels. And, and, and therefore, we can study really what happens to them in a, in a classical uh, physiological situation. We found, in, in, in short, exactly the opposite from what people have found before. So we found that um, <laughs> we tested multiple times whether we, we swapped the samples or not, and we did not. Um, so we find that hypoxia leads to upregulation of cell cell adhesion. Uh, and uh, you may know that there are some data that point to uh, link hypoxia to EMT. This is not what we see in vivo, at least not in, in this model. Uh, we see the opposite. We see upregulation of cell cell adhesion molecules in hypoxic cells. So it's, it's almost like if, if cells that are hypoxic would, would tend to uh, stick to each other much more. And so then when you look at CTCs, it's clear that clusters are also much more hypoxic than single CTCs. And if you do the same experiment, what I showed you before, you can see that clusters are more, hypoxic clusters are more metastatic than non-hypoxic clusters, even though the non-hypoxic clusters are, are, are very, very rare. 
and uh, uh, given the, the, the half life of CTCs and, and a number of additional data that I don't have the time to show you, we really think that hypoxia in the tumor uh, uh, demarcates very clearly the regions that are the, 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 the originators uh, of, of, of CTC clusters. So these are the regions where clusters are coming from. And single CTCs, you can see it here, even if they are hypoxic sometimes, uh, rarely though they are hypoxic, but even when they are, they don't really gain additional metastatic potential. So this is somehow the summary of what I told you. We find that tumors are hypoxic, not only in the core, but in different regions. Sometimes there is also uh, infiltration of neutrophils. And when this happens, uh, there is the generation and formation of clusters of CTCs that are hypoxic or, or CTC neutrophils uh, that are also hypoxic. And these are mainly responsible for metastasis formation in breast cancer. Uh, what we are also doing now is to uh, uh, leverage our ability to, to expand circulating tumor cells in cultures. So what we did, uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, in press now, is a paper from, from Manuel Scheidman, uh, also a PhD student in my lab. And what he did is um, he isolated CTCs from patients, like I showed you before. He expanded them uh, briefly in suspension cultures so with, with, without touching the plastic, but always being in suspension, growing as, uh, as clusters or as organoids. And uh, then uh, he injected them in mice in the mammary fat pad. And, 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 and a few months later, and that's the nice thing about it, is that these cells spontaneously spread to the very same organs that were characteristic of uh, the, the metastasis of the patient where we got the CTC. So we get spontaneous metastatic dissemination to bone, to brain, to liver, and to lymph node. And with patient-derived models, this is extremely rare. So they all typically go to the lungs or most of them. And, and we, we were able to recapitulate instead uh, things like bone metastasis. You can see here the entire femur uh, of the mouse. This is a uh, imaging done from Tim Schroeder at ETH. And you can see here metastasis uh, to the bone spontaneously uh, derived from the mammary tumor. This is the spinal cord. We see DTCs in single cell and cluster form, uh, huge metastasis uh, here as well. A uh, close-up picture showing you how cancer cells invade the, the characteristic bone uh, structure that you see here. Uh, metastasis to the brain. Uh, this is a very large metastasis, probably arrived earlier uh, than others. Uh, did, and then I'm not sure if the resolution here allows it, but uh, you, you can also see, uh, hopefully, um, micrometastasis and disseminated tumor cells uh, throughout the brain. And then what Manuel has done with this model, he has engineered uh, the, our CTC-derived cells with, with Cas9 and then with the genome-wide uh, uh, CRISPR library. And then he, uh, he injected them in mice and he let uh, the mice uh, go and, uh, and leave as, as much as they could. And then he isolated all the metastases and the CTCs and the, the tumor cells uh, to ask uh, which gene is responsible for each and every step of metastatic cascade including organ-specific metastasis, and we found some, some interesting core feature. Okay, so take-home messages uh, from, from this presentation are that CTC clusters are precursors of metastasis in breast cancer. They display hypomethylation of binding sites for OCT4, SOX2, NANOG, as well as other stem cell and proliferation-related transcription factors. We identified compounds that are FDA approved and that can uh, dissociate CTC clusters and suppress metastasis in mice. And now we are testing them in patients to see whether this holds true. Um, we found that neutrophils can associate to CTCs and when they, uh, when they do bind to CTCs, they literally boost CTC proliferation in, in the circulation and they increase their metastatic ability. And finally, that hypoxia, intratumor hypoxia, leads to cell cell junction upregulation and travasation of CTC clusters with a very high metastatic ability. And uh, last but not least, these are the people that, uh, that, that contributed to the, to, the, to the work, that did the work that I showed you. So these are people in my lab at the ATH, uh, our collaborators in, in various hospitals in Zurich, in Basel, uh, Basel Land, uh, as well as abroad. Uh, colleagues at the, at the ETH, uh, as well as external collaborators, and of course, funding that makes our work possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for this uh, 
terrific talk summarizing you know what you guys have really done over the last uh, many years um this is really very cool so a quick question uh so regarding dissemination and cluster formation at what stage do the neutrophils join do they join already from the primary tumor or do they meet neutrophils in the bloodstream um you know which helps them to survive etc yeah that's a very good question andrea so we we think they do meet in the primary tumor uh that's uh, that's because they they need to have enough time to to build up junctions that are that are stable and and this is very hard to do under under sheer stress under under flow in the in the bloodstream we also did experiments where we injected cancer cells directly in the in the circulation and measured whether they would interact in some way with neutrophils and they don't have enough time in the circulation to interact with neutrophils they, they get cleared very quickly uh, so so definitely the interaction the, the first interaction happens at the level of the tumor mm -hmm. so there's a question from uh, hector uh, hi nicola really nice talk uh, hector Pinado from cnio uh, did you check if CTC clusters home more efficiently in metastatic organs? Do they reinforce early metastatic dissemination in experimental metastasis assays? Um, yes, so they, 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 well, it depends, Hector. It's, it's a difficult answer to give you. It depends on the models you look at. I think in general, um, they do tend to uh, home preferentially to, to, to certain organs. Uh, I would say though that, that, that it's, it's hard to, to give a conclusive answer because it depends also on how you inject them. Um, it, it depends on what is the first capillary network that they meet. Uh, for, for example, if, if one does an experimental uh, approach such, a, such as a tail vein injection, Clearly, they go to the lungs, right? Because that's the first capillary network that they that they need. We've done other uh, other experiments where we are we are we are injecting them in different locations. We are also trying to get blood from different locations in patients to study how frequent these clusters are, depending on where the 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 the, the, the blood samples are taken. And but this is all we we don't have yet enough uh, data, so I cannot answer you yet. Next question is from Anab Chaudhary. A fascinating talk. Did you see CTC and platelet binding between platelets and neutrophils? Is there any preferential binding for CTCs? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we do see platelet bindings to, to pretty much all CTCs. We do, we do see it a little bit indirectly. So we see, for instance, when we do RNA sequencing, we see uh, genes that are very characteristic of, of, of platelets. Um, uh, transcript that are very characteristic of platelets being there uh, in, 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 in all types of CTCs. So single cells, clusters, clusters with neutrophils. Uh, we are trying to think about also how to, to image this um, and, and, to, and to look at uh, platelets in a, in a more direct way. But I think the short answer is that yes, we do see platelets interacting with CTCs. They are there also in CTC neutrophils, so there is not really a displacement, but they they, they actually bind as well, and, uh, and, uh, and and I think their biology has been shown in the past to be relevant for metastasis, and we think uh, this is the case absolutely. All right, there's a question from Olofun Lola Adizina. Great work, Nicola. Is it safe to assume that oral carcinoma cancer stem cells will behave the same as CTCs described in this experiment? Uh, no, I think uh, we don't have any data on this particular tumor type, so I would not assume anything. Um, I think one would have to look, uh, but um, uh, yeah, I think our findings at the moment are on breast cancer. We, we are now looking at um, uh, different tumor types. We've started investigations in, uh, in, in prostate cancer, in, in pancreatic cancer, in melanoma, lung cancer, colon cancer but uh, uh, not uh, oral carcinoma, so I don't know. There's a question from Penelope Ortiwell, and afterwards, uh, uh, Alpaslan, you can then afterwards um, ask your question live. So first, Penelope, nice talk. Uh, traditionally, it has been thought that tumor cells need to home to a niche before they can form metastasis. Do you think the clusters can forge 
uh, lodging in the niche, or is it likely that single cells use the niche to metastasize to and clusters use a different mechanisms? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I don't know the answer. I, I can speculate that um, the, 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 the formation of metastasis from, 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 from the side of CTC clusters is, is a very aggressive and physical um, event. So the, the first step clearly is, 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 is physical. So these are multicellular uh, uh, complexes and they do get stuck. Literally, they get stuck in capillaries at distant sites. And when they get stuck there, niche or not, then they have a chance to grow because the circulation in that particular capillary is blocked. There is no flow anymore. So they can, they, they have time, they, they have time to grow. Uh, and I don't know whether they need a, a, a niche to do that or whether they can do that without a niche. I think this needs to be, um, uh, still needs to be, uh, to be described. And do clusters undergo dormancy? Great question. I don't know. I, I think they are much more proliferative than single cells. So they, if, if we go for the dogmatic definition of, of dormancy, that they, that they do not proliferate, I think it's less likely that they would go into dormancy compared to single cells. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also depends on what happens after, after dissemination, right? So they could arrive very proliferative. And I'm talking about patient samples. In mouse models, it, it all happens too quickly. I, I think it's more difficult to answer there. But in patients, um, after dissemination, they could lose proliferation ability and go into dormancy theoretically. But I, I, think, I, I don't know the answer. Aslan? Uh, Nicola, thank you so much for a nice talk. I mean, it's beautiful as always. Um, quick question to your uh, two questions. One question is your cell culture condition or your CDC culture condition. If you modify it a little bit, do you see differences in um, the genes you're um, you're depending on? Because uh, I, I don't know exactly how you culture them. Um, the second question is, um, you nicely show that CDCs need neutrophils during dissemination or during circulation. Um, do you think when they disseminate to an organ, they might help them also metabolically? They might provide them something they need in the first stage, um, as uh, Andreas um, high, um, uh, highlighted it with the dormancy, that they give them something metabolically, or is it just a mechanical shedding? Thank you. Um, I'll start from the second. I think uh, I think they definitely there is definitely a crosstalk which which helps circulating tumor cells to to seed metastasis. We, we've tried to characterize this a little bit. It's, it's in the paper in the, the supplementary data, so, but but basically there are. Uh, several exchanges. We looked at cytokines mainly, um, but but I'm pretty sure that, that, that there's more than that. And certainly, they might have a role also in metabolically helping cancer cells to to achieve what they what they want to achieve, which is which is metastasis. The the first question on culture conditions, the the detailed culture conditions that we use were were published in a in a science paper in in 2014. And uh, basically, it's a, it's a classical stem cell media, so it's it's deprived of uh, of, of uh, um, FBS, for instance. And we put selective uh, growth factors. We put FGF, we put EGF, uh, we put B twenty seven, and we keep the cells in in suspension culture, so we don't let them touch the plastic. The other thing that is very important is we, we, we grow them in hypoxia or what people refer to as hypoxia, which is 5% oxygen in the, in the, in the incubator. Um, because if you grow them in a classical 20% uh, oxygen incubator, they, they, they don't grow actually very well. So they need low oxygen levels. Uh, we've not really tried to perturb these conditions much and, and, and look at gene expression. This is something we have not done. We, we, we use cultures simply to, to amplify them and to have more cells, and then we immediately inject them in mice again. Awesome. Thank you. Can you, uh, you. just to follow up, can you, can you passage these cells? I mean, it's really a cell line over time. Yes. And how, uh, yes. what's the efficiency per, per patient? So we can passage them indefinitely. So the moment we, we get them to grow, they, they behave really like a cell line. Uh, as long as you um, um, use the, 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 the culture conditions that I mentioned. Um, and the efficiency uh, on, the, on the other hand is, is, is horrible. 
So we, it's extremely difficult to create cell lines from CTCs. So we uh, roughly, we have a success rate of, I would say, 5%. So patients that have CTCs um, uh, that we can isolate uh, and we try to culture, we are successful five times out of 100. And uh, usually we are successful in patients that have a lot of CTCs. So I think it's as simple as that. The more cells you start with, the, the more likely we can get a cell line out of it. And, and otherwise it's very, very difficult. Yeah. And um, the final question by Anka Maria Chimpin. Uh, um, what kind of microfluidic system did you use? Uh, are they developed in-house or are they commercial? Um, and do you use commercial microfluidic systems specifically designed for metast metastasis research? Yeah, so we, we use both. It depends a little bit on the on the on the question that we want to answer, but uh, most of the data that I showed you was was achieved with the uh, with the Parsortex system. So this is a, a commercially available device, uh, but we don't use Parsortex in in, in in the in the, in the classical way. So we, we developed uh, protocols to to improve capture rates and and, and to improve. Uh, release rates, so to get more CTCs out of the microchip, so we can do all our analysis. Uh, so it, it's a little bit of both. So it's commercially available systems, and it's systems that we developed in house uh, that, that we use to improve CTC capture. I think. How do you maintain cells and culture indefinitely? I think we already answered. Or you want to say something? Yeah. More? No, it's the same answer as before. Yeah. So we and then uh, the final question by Julie, alive. Julie Di Martino. Um, if you have access to um, uh, very advanced metastatic uh, uh, cancer patient uh, uh, sample, and if in there you see an increase of CTCs compared to uh, less advanced uh, uh, cancer patients. Yes, we, we, we do. Uh, I think in the literature is also uh, uh, um, the, there's, the, there's huge clinical studies that have been done with, with a lot of patients and with. with different CTC technologies like, like cell search system, is very clear that the, the more advanced the disease is, the more CTCs you, you observe. And that's because there are more cancer cells in, in, in the patient. And so the likelihood that you're able to detect them in, in a small volume of blood is, is, is increased. Um, so we do detect them also in, in very early cancers, stage one. Uh, and, and, and later, naturally, uh, but the numbers are much lower, so the, the earlier the disease is. And uh, is this something that you also, uh, that we can also check in patients where the primary tumor has been resected, like meaning uh, suggesting a recirculation of cancer cells? Uh, uh, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Uh, I think, uh, um, so the, the, the heart life of CTCs is extremely low. It's extremely short. We are talking about minutes, uh, practically. So if you imagine a patient where the primary tumor has been resected and, and some CTCs are still circulating, I think they, they will not be able to circulate for a long time. Sooner or later, they will uh, get stuck somewhere in the circulation. Uh, they will be attacked by the immune system. Uh, they will lodge in some capillary, and it will be very hard to, to see CTCs in a patient that has been uh, resected, the, where the primary tumor has been resected. What, what I was meaning is a, a, a cell that will have ending in a secondary site that will have uh, already like uh, started to metastasize. So patients with, with micrometastatic disease. Yeah, yeah. Go, going like mm -hmm. uh, under a certain dormancy period of time and then reactivating and recirculating. So <clears> patient. <throat> that have metastatic disease later yeah. on? Um, yeah, there, I think chances are a bit higher to see CTCs, uh, but still quite low, in my opinion, compared, compared to cases where the disease is, 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 is manifesting in a different way, where the disease is really progressive and not responding to therapy. I think these cases where the, the, there are cancer cells, but they, they, there are micrometastases and they, it's not clear where they are and so on. Um, there theoretically there could be CTCs in circulation, but uh, probably their number is, is extremely low 